you all right, man? Hey, you all right? Hey, bud. It's called preparation! Many of Portland, Oregon's 700,000 citizens say they feel overrun by drug users from around the country who have come to Oregon to take advantage of a law that allows them to carry small amounts of heroin, meth, cocaine, LSD, and other drugs, including the deadly synthetic opioid fentanyl that addicts can be seen lighting up on sheets of aluminum foil and inhaling in broad daylight. This has been the new norm in Oregon since 2020, when 60% of voters in Oregon passed the Drug Addiction Treatment and Recovery Act, better known as Measure 110. Measure 110 was seen as a bold new strategy designed to treat drug addiction as a health issue, not a criminal one. In other words, instead of putting drug users in prison for possession, which has been the norm around the United States the last 50 years as part of America's so-called war on drugs, Drug users in Oregon can be checked into addiction treatment centers to get clean instead of going to jail. At least, that was the plan. In the years since Measure 110 passed, critics are calling it a disaster. Starting with the obvious eyesore, rampant drug use has become on the streets. Even street musicians like Ten here and her husband Daniel, who say they are familiar with drug addiction, say the drug use on the streets of Portland today is out of control. A lot of people don't use discretion anymore. Like, um, like just because it's legal doesn't mean you have to be out in the park in front of kids smoking. You know what I mean? And that's unfortunately what a lot of people kind of did once they got decriminalized. Critics of Measure 110 say it's led to skyrocketing fentanyl-related overdose deaths in Portland, a 600% increase in fatal overdoses, for example, the year before decriminalizing drugs in 2019, there were 280 opioid overdose deaths. That number then jumped to 745 deaths in 2021. This photo released by federal agents shows just how little fentanyl it takes to kill someone. Authorities say there has also been a major spike in crime since decriminalization of drugs. Releasing this photo of some of the drugs, guns, and cash confiscated in Oregon in just one month in 2023. The increase in shootings in Oregon, they say, quite alarming. There were 413 shooting incidents in Portland the year before decriminalization in 2019, tripling to 1,309 in 2022, two years after decriminalizing drugs. Under Measure 110, those caught with less than a gram of heroin or less than two grams of meth are issued the equivalent of a traffic ticket with a $100 fine that can be waived by calling a treatment referral number and agreeing to participate in a health assessment and getting addiction treatment. The problem, say authorities, is most drug users say they'll just pay the fine with a very small fraction of them actually choosing to get treatment. Perhaps even more problematic, say authorities, is there are simply not enough addiction treatment centers. New centers that were supposed to be funded by the state's marijuana tax revenue sales and funded by money state taxpayers were supposed to save from less people needing to be housed in prisons. Since decriminalization of drugs in Oregon, the state has been ranked number one in the number of drug users. 
According to the National Survey on Drug Use, in 2021, nearly 10% of teenagers and adults here were said to be experiencing illicit drug use disorder or addicted to drugs. There are too many addicts in Portland, authorities say, for the current number of treatment centers available. State data indicates there are presently around 200 addiction treatment and rehab facilities in Portland, but they say that's still not enough to help thousands of addicts on the streets. Oregon Recovers is one of the state's most respected nonprofits helping people recover from addiction, but was ironically one of the biggest opponents of decriminalizing drugs the way Oregon chose about doing it, says co-founder Mike Marshall because he says they feared exactly what has happened, a floodgate opening up for rampant drug use with not enough recovery centers and services in place to help them. So decriminalization is hugely important, but how you do it is equally important. And the challenge with Measure 110 is it basically put the cart before the horse. In other words, it uh, took away the, the criminal justice intervention system without building an alternative system first. And so the net result was we stopped um, uh, engaging people in their drug use, leaving them to, to sort of go unfettered, um, while we simultaneously started to build this alternative pathway. But that takes time. Marshall says well-intended state lawmakers may have been inspired to follow the footsteps of Portugal in decriminalizing drugs. However, Portugal, he says, spent a decade making sure drug recovery treatment facilities and services were in place before decriminalizing drugs. That wasn't done in Oregon, he says. Portugal, on the other hand, built that pathway before they decriminalized drugs. So again, we put the cart before the horse. Haven Wheelock, who runs a nonprofit needle exchange program in Portland, helped lawmakers write Measure 110. The goal, she says, was to stop Oregon's long history of incarcerating drug users, the vast majority of them Blacks and Hispanics. She says even if recovery centers and services are not yet in place as an alternative to prison, they will be, she says, over time. And she says she pays little attention to critics complaining that Oregon put the cart before the horse. We hear the cart before the horse argument all the time. To me, the harms of incarceration were so bad that I wanted those harms to stop. If we would have waited to build out the like health care side of this, it would have been years of harming people, harming primarily black and brown people. And it didn't feel right to continue to punish people for a substance use disorder, which is a health care issue, while we wait for health care to be ready for them. Putting drug users in prison, according to one U.S. government study, has harmed children of drug users who are placed in foster homes. Children in foster homes increasingly becoming prime targets for predators running sex trafficking rings. Children becoming drug users themselves as adults to escape their childhood traumas traumas that Carmen Pacheco Jones says she experienced when she was 16. Her own mother's imprisonment for drugs, she says, left her feeling betrayed and alone and fending for herself on the streets. Suffering so much loneliness, she says, that she herself began using drugs to escape her traumas. It's why many people use drugs, she says, to become oblivious to the pain. The state of oblivion takes you away from everything. Like, you know, and I'll share with you like one example. Um, I had, um, you know, experienced um, a, a gang rape and um, I was able to escape. She escaped the gang rape only to be raped again an hour later by a family man who offered her a ride with his child in the car. This man with a child picks me up and I'm thinking, I'm gonna be safe, you know? There's a child in the car and I wasn't, you know? Her drug use early on resulted in her losing her own five children to foster homes. But she later got clean and got them back in her life. She credits drug treatment, not jail, with helping her turn her life around. I want um, individuals who are experiencing addiction to be treated as, as they have a disease, as, you know, to be given the services they need 
Carmen is lobbying for decriminalization of drugs here where she lives north of Oregon in Spokane, Washington. An all-American town that celebrates freedom every 4th of July on Independence Day, but whose citizens are widely against efforts to decriminalize drugs here. Citizens like Vanessa Reasoner on the left and her daughter Frankie. I don't agree with decriminalizing something that puts people in the grave at all. Marijuana is one thing. They're talking about the harder drugs and I'm just, I'm not okay with that. I don't believe that it should be decriminalized. I believe people should be held accountable for their actions and doing drugs and stuff can kill little children and innocent people and I'm not, I'm not okay with it at all. They say they were stunned when even fentanyl was decriminalized in Oregon. Fentanyl, one of the primary narcotics blamed for killing upwards of 100,000 users a year in the United States. Many of the deaths accidental overdoses because many people still don't know how lethal fentanyl is. So I don't see why they would decriminalize that one if everybody is pretty much dying of overdoses of fentanyl. Jonathan Teeters, a community organizer here in Spokane, who successfully lobbied lawmakers here to legalize marijuana, believes other harder drugs can be responsibly decriminalized, just as alcohol was decriminalized 100 years ago to end prohibition. Alcohol is legal and regulated, right? You can go get alcohol if you're an adult and make your own decisions, but you can't drink it in your car while you're driving. You can't be drunk out on the streets in most places. You know, there are rules around how we manage it, and I think we can do the same thing potentially with what we call illegal drugs. And we also uh, have this sort of individualistic belief that uh, everybody's kind of on their own or that somehow it's a, it's a sign of weakness if we want to help people who need help. What many citizens in Oregon agree on, whether they support or oppose decriminalization of drugs, is that scenes like this of wide open, blatant drug use must end, and that there need to be many more addiction recovery centers opened soon, as promised under Measure 110. However, the fate of Measure 110 is now in question, as an increasing number of Oregonians recently polled on the effectiveness of decriminalizing drugs believe it's an experiment that has proven to be a colossal failure.